Foster Car Finance, proud sponsors of the Awawi Farmerland podcast. Haha, <laughs> it's right, lad. Hello and welcome back to the How Are We Family Land podcast with me, John May, and Jazz Dickens, my co-host, and our very special t- guest today is round two, round two, yeah, we're Lawrence Kenwright, due to popular demands. How are we, Family Land and Ding Dong? Hold on, <laughs> Ding Dong's my land, not yours. <laughs> I stole that. <laughs> oh, let's just change the podcast name now. How are we? So, Lawrence, welcome back. Thank you. How's Back things? Um, good. Waiting to get open again and uh, get guests back into what is a very empty hotel. Mm. Is it eerie in there? It's like The Shining. Is it? Oh, I've got two five year old kids and I take them on bike rides <laughs> down like the corridors. The Shining. And I look at the bikes and I go, this ain't right. <laughs> you probably never get that again, though, will you? Over well, it's happened three times you. already, so. It's tough, isn't it? Yeah, you took us on a little tour around the hotel, didn't you? With yeah. Little week, it was amazing, amazing. You were surprised, weren't you? What, by your flowers? <laughs> Lawrence has been doing these flowers on the ceiling for uh, weeks. It looks beautiful. Well, when, I, when we first went into lockdown, I was that depressed. I was getting battered by the press and I was getting battered from all angles. So I, I went down to the bowels of the Shankly, which has got three floors of car park, and I opened all these storage rooms and pulled out all the stuff that had been discarded from years ago and I put it on the roof. So I asked... I think it was Lee Butler who come in, and so Lee Butler come in and looked at it and said, well, should we put an event on the roof? And I said, oh, would yeah, it be amazing if you did. And then when we got up the next day after the first event went on, he, he sold out 15. So that was pretty much the saving of, yeah. of me and my involvement with the Shankly. Otherwise, I could have been gone. Yeah. Because there was just no money coming in at all. Shout out Lee Butler. Thank you, Lee. Ah, boss. So it's like, now, when you're reopening, what, what's going to be different? Well, so apart from what we've done on the roof, which if you come in July when we opened up again, that was uh, there for all to see. And I had 300 plus guests every single event on the roof, which we were the first ones to do. And I think we led the way. And I think there's an awful lot of bars and restaurants that were kicking off saying, you know, how are these getting away with it? But we had the health and safety executive on site all the time. And uh, we didn't get closed down, thank God. So that was good. Uh, and then now I've changed the Bastion restaurant into an Amazon jungle. Have you? Yeah, so I get up at three o'clock pretty much every day <laughs> and I get my stable going in hand. Oh, is that you put, what you, you mean? Put more, stuff, actually, have you put more stuff up? Yeah, yeah I, I haven't stopped. Every morning I get up at three o'clock. I'm, I'm pretty much up on the ladder at four. And um, and I've changed the whole of the Bastion restaurant into into an Amazon jungle. Both from Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> you found that a pizza? Uh, I think it's great at three or four in the morning, just getting up and phone not going, emails not going, yeah. and just doing your own thing and being creative and and then looking back and going. Oh, this is a peaceful time. If you got your, if you got your time to yourself at three o'clock, it's, I I like that time myself. When the world's when the world's asleep, yeah. you can get more done as well. Do, do you actually get up at three in the morning? I used to give four o'clock, four do o'clock. You, I'm to go training. Yeah, yeah, and then it, that little time you get alone before before the kids get up and stuff like that. It's like you've got. <laughs> It's like a lot of time, isn't it? You, get, you can get a lot of done. That's your period of time. So do you go to bed half nine, ten o'clock? Yeah. Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah. Half nine, yeah. ten. Up at three, four. Get all my emails done. Do whatever work I need to do. Yeah. And then, then I go to work. So I'm, I'm probably about an 18 hour day guy, to be honest. So, you know, when you, so when you reopen, you've got like a, a, a quite a few challenges, haven't you? Because there's, as you say, you know, people can't even travel here anymore to Liverpool, can they? Yeah. And then you've got, like, there's other things like Brexit as well. Yeah. It's like... Well, well Brexit, well, no one really talks about Brexit because it's been overshadowed by the pandemic. But Brexit, pretty much, when Parliament went against government... Now, I, I was all for staying in Europe. Um, but once um, democracy spoke, then, you know, we had to go. Um, but for some reason, Parliament, with a vote of 400 against 200 decided that we weren't going to leave. But what that done, and no one really talks about it, was it just stopped everything. Mm. Uh, it just stopped investment. People who poured money in, into the UK before just literally stopped overnight and said, no, no, we're going to wait. And then there came an election. And that was sort of one, if you like, by the Conservatives on the 13th of December. And then everything waited then till January. And then as January come, and we were waiting for funds to start coming in again because we need to refinance all of our sites to pay off our investors, um, the pandemic come. Mm. 
So then that stopped everyone from investing then, because then who's going to invest in a hotel group when you don't even know when you're open? See, because, like, you know, like, loads of people want to vote, vote out of Europe. If it weren't for, like, European money, Liverpool. I mean, a lot hasn't a lot of that come from European money? It, it, for sure, Liverpool has benefited greatly from European money, but, you know... You go back to the 80s when we had the Hatton era, era and obviously the city struggled for quite a while. I think we lost 120,000 people in that period of time uh, because we just didn't get any jobs. But it was good for us in some ways because um, Margaret Thatcher decided to put all the investment into Leeds and Manchester. Leeds and Manchester used that money to knock down an awful lot of their buildings. And then I came along some years later and started doing all the old listed buildings and turning them into hotels. So that was good for me. I don't know whether it was good for anyone in the 80s at the time. It, it certainly wasn't good for me when I was 18 years of age trying to find a job. Mm. Then, you know, Heseltine come in. And if it wasn't for Heseltine come in, obviously he's a conservative, we wouldn't have the Albert Dock. And Albert Dock is, without any doubt, the catalyst for Liverpool coming back. The Royal Albert Dock. Yeah. That's what it is now, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well the, the Albert Dock is the largest grade one listed building in the UK and it was derelict and forlorn on the Mersey for all them years and now it's not you know now it's a fantastic shopping centre um, and it is the catalyst for Liverpool coming back Yeah. and then from that we got Liverpool 1 which actually wasn't the Labour Party that was the Lib Dems so the Lib Dems brought about Liverpool 1 and Liverpool 1 because that was about 2008 and we won Capital Culture and uh, I opened the business around then. Mm. And there was a tidal wave that come of tourism. What, what did that do for the city launch, the capital oh. culture? Well, it, it was unfair for us, really, because as we got the capital culture, we also had the world crash. So it sort of come and then dropped yeah. away. Yeah. But Liverpool, if I'd have said to you 15 years ago, Liverpool's going to be a tourist destination in the top five, you'd have laughed. I'd have certainly laughed. But now Liverpool is, you know, it just knocked Glasgow off two years ago from the sixth position to the fifth position. And and it's pushing on. And I absolutely believe firmly that Liverpool is going to go from strength to strength. We, we really only have tourism, really. Yeah, yeah. We don't really have much more. But it was all started by Hazeltine, in my view. So we just briefly spoke about that. It was like Maggie Tatty, because she's, she's meant to have said, wasn't well, she? Let them rot. Is this, yeah. is this true? A absolutely, it I is. I think it was in a, you, there's evidence that you can see it, can't you? Yeah, no, absolutely, it is. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was a very tough broad, wasn't she? You know, she she uh, disliked Liverpool a lot and and starved us of cash. And in her battle with the Labour regime and also, you know, Derek Hatton, an awful lot of people fell foul of that, mm. you know, and, and Liverpool suffered for many, many years over that. We went from 600,000 people and in seven years we went down to 480. Really? Is that many people left? Yeah, because there's no jobs. If there's no investment, there's no jobs. If there aren't any jobs, why would you stay here? You know, and communities are broken up. But then, you know, we are made a tough stuff out when we come back. Yeah. But well, that's just that's interesting, that story, because <clears throat> Heseltine and his boys sort of, like, shoved Maggie out, didn't he? I think it's alleged. I don't know for sure, but Margaret Thatcher, when she was getting pushed out, actually said, you know, anyone but Heseltine and I'll go. Mm. But I, I think, you know, without any doubt, Hazeltine's the favourite Conservative because of what he done for the city. Seems to, seems to be a lot of hatred towards um, Thatcher the year in the pool, didn't he? I remember wow. when she died, I was on the floor, like, celebrating people's deaths and uh, it's a bit heavy for me, but I've seen, like, some of the stuff that was going on. There was pure resentment there, weren't he? Oh, so, we, we fell foul of Margaret Thatcher more than any other city without any shadow of any doubt. But luckily for us, has the time come through. And, you know, he, he created small little villages in, in Eldonians and cleaned up the mares. He actually is the catalyst for where we are now. Yeah. That's, a, that's like, without a doubt, you know, there's two main things, which is the Albert Dock and Liverpool. They're the two main things for us. It's like Liverpool was this, well, they used to call it the second city of the empire because this was the main dock, wasn't it? Yeah. Like everything come through here. So I suppose Liverpool made its money on the docks. And once that wasn't used anymore, she probably thought there's no use to them anymore. Well, well Liverpool lost it to Felixstone because when containerization come in, uh, it all went to Felixstone. We, we lost it. And also the Mersey silt up. So it was a tough harbour, really, even though we're getting it back now. Mm. You know, we've we've got all these cranes that Peels were put in. I think they paid 350 odd million pounds to bring these cranes in. So, uh, And also, I think, uh, Joe Anderson... Uh, raised 260 million for highways, roadworks, etc. Yeah. 
uh, in order to make the serviceability from those docks much easier to get to the motorway. So th- there's a lot of good stuff that we've done. Um, there's also a lot of bad stuff that we've done, uh, which you know we're seeing now coming out on the press today with House of Parliament and the report they've done there. But in in general, you know, the city has come from strength to strength. Mm. Um, politics plays sometimes a demonic role in in how we are seen and how we deliver. How's um, how how's this affected you, Lawrence? Because you own, you you know, you own quite a few hotels. You own lots of property in a city. You employ a lot of people. How's this affected you mentally? I, I would say, without any doubt, that this has been the toughest time of my fifty-five year existence. Do you feel a massive pressure? Um, not as much now, but certainly when hotel closed, um, no money coming in whatsoever. Investors coming after me and the Echo coming after me and the council coming after me all at the same time. It doesn't make for a pretty existence. So I pretty much turn my phone off and just plant a flowers on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> Learned how to breathe to get rid of that anxiety that you obviously feel. Uh, and I was lucky really because one of the main investors, that was the first one to state that if I, he doesn't get his money back, you know, he's going he's gonna to be in trouble, which went in the Echo. They ran that same story probably 15 times, just with different clickbait headlines. He's actually become the chairman of the investors, and I've now got 95% of the investors actually voted for us now to, to be in favour. And I probably made a mistake at the time when the Echo were hitting me with all those stories, since you live and collapses, all this sort of stuff, which we haven't. In essence, I just went undercover and decided to just say nothing because I didn't know yeah. when we were going to open. I didn't know when I could, you know, refinance the hotels. There was no fund in the world that wants to finance hotels when they don't know when it's going to open up again. So I had nothing to say. And I felt if I would have said anything, the Echo would have pulled it up and torn it to shreds. And I would have probably shot the only bullet in the chamber and I decided to stay quiet. Because I stayed quiet, that void that was created then became an extremely negative one because the Echo was saying this, that, and the other. And then the investors would see that. And they would just go, well, clearly he hasn't said anything. So we must be doing whatever. And just for the record, you know, I I work 18 hours a day. I, I still work 18 hours a day. My wages are extremely low. I live in the Shankly Hotel. I don't have a single asset in the world. My car's eight years old. I do not spend money. Um, and every single penny that came into the business went into the bricks and mortar of that business. And I never took anything out. Still to this day, I haven't. And the proof of that is the administration that came in, uh, I think they would have threw me out of my ear if it did, and, and I didn't. And because of that honesty, I've, I'm still here today, and because of that honesty, um, my investors have voted 95% of vote in favour of keep me where I am um, to battle. Because the other thing is, our hotels are not like other hotels. Oh. They've been sort of designed and built with my strange warped mind. So I understand the importance of being different and not being part of the same cabal that everyone else sort of sort of wanders towards. The Willy Wonka Hotel, I was telling you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, we done one in Rain Hill and one of the, one of the, uh, one of the guests came into the week and she she was saying, you know, everyone can't wait till it opens, whatever. You know, we call you around here. And I said, no, what do you call me? We call you Willy Wonka. I went, oh, <laughs> After she opened the lines all the news, she said, I, I mentioned something about... He was an open terrace over the road, and I wanted to know about your mind, Lance. I said, "What? What do you see there? Because all I see is a boxing, boxing, boxing. I see it opens, open booths up, gym. And you said, well, "What you do with it?" Nah. And you said, "I've got a gym. Do you want to come and see it?" I thought you were going to show me a bag or a ring or something like that. I mean, well, it is. It was just like five hundred machines <laughs> <laughs> and a gym like no other, yeah, hey, with fluorescent lights yeah, everywhere. And no just didn't expect yeah. it. Yeah. And then you said about the car park, yeah. the three-story car park, hundred cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really funny when you come down, both of you come down, because you were both like, it's yours written the floor going, what's going on in here? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't expect it all, the, every team, you got team rooms and all that, it's just amazing. That room with, experience. The, with the bat and the, running down the middle. The Roman bat down That's the middle. That's fucking brilliant, that. That's great, that. Yeah. Uh, 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 you, I've got a good mate who, who works with me. His name's Dave Elwood, and um, we've been together pretty much from day one. And he's a really, really, really close mate. 
although we work together and um, we bounce off each other all the time and we giggle all day. Imagine this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's that from the ceiling, you know, like, you've like, got all kinds of weird things going on in our heads and we try and outdo each other, you know. Most people really don't funny. go ahead and do it, don't they? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, we got to play it safe. <laughs> so I'll I'll get up at three or four o'clock in the morning and I'll get up my, my stapler and I'll be putting things on the wall and I'll be emailing them at half three. Have you seen this? <laughs> and you know it's pinging away on his on his email you know but it's really funny on the um on the like looking at like the previous one you were on it's like some people how do you deal with this lawrence it's like some people are really praising you and some people like add like nasty comments and stuff or you probably don't even know you how do you how do you deal with that like i, I can only ever be honest and um i think that's the problem because an awful lot of those people a lot of them are politically left-wing motivated mostly you know i'm a labor guy but i'm not left-wing i don't believe in, in in extremes of anything i think middle ground the most um and i think what you'll find is all those accounts are all fake and uh the odd ones aren't and they're allowed their opinion you know if you don't like me or you think i've got fake teeth or you think i've got you know have you got fake teeth well i haven't got the same teeth <laughs> as you <laughs> um but i think i think people are going to have their opinion and i'm reasonably opinionated so uh, I, I won't hold back. If I've got something to say, we'll say it. You know, and I think that's the problem, certainly with social media, that I don't really go on much anymore because of that. Yeah. But I think that's the problem with social media, that people can, uh, underneath the veil, mm. state what they want, and they're not accountable. Whereas I, I'm accountable for everything I say. That's, that's not the full story, though, Lawrence, is it? Because the comments, a lot of them is really, really good. People were saying, to you, as we were speaking about the mayor and stuff like that, people were yeah. saying... Why don't you go for the mayor? A lot of comments, a lot of people missed him. He's saying he was brilliant. Why, why, why? He's got so much knowledge in this area about creating capital and stuff like that. What, where, where's his, why, why can't he, he stand up for the city as one of us? Because um, there's no there's no doubt that um, businessmen, good businessmen who understand how to create narrative and bring in investment to create jobs, have their tools sharpened pretty much every hour of every day. Whereas... Politicians don't. Their main job is to make sure that they don't put themselves in a poor position. My job is to make sure I do the best for whatever I intend to do. So if my job was to create jobs, I would make sure I'm creating jobs. And the more jobs I create, the better the standard of living would be for people. I don't think politicians get up in the morning to create jobs. I think politicians come up for self-reservation. Survival mode. And they want to survive. Yeah. And they want to make sure that they don't cause themselves any issues. Whereas I will jump in and say... No, that's wrong. Like, I've obviously been at war now with the council for a number of years, and, and I feel sort of vilified in some way because I've come out there and been that lone guy who's been stating these things. Yes. But now, you know, you see what's happened recently, and it's not for me to trample on anyone, but the best for this city has just happened. Even though people are now saying it's not good for our city, you know, governance is taking over. But what you've got to remember, people, is that... The message from the city now is about, it's nothing to do with me, but it's all about fraud and corruption. And we need to ensure that Liverpool is not known for fraud and corruption. And when governance comes in, central government maybe, does Liverpool in this battle with other cities for funding, and we are in a battle, whether you like it or not, we're in a battle with Manchester. And Manchester are kicking our ass. There's no two ways about it. And the reason why they're kicking our ass is because that was drawn by... Richard Lees, he is the political leader. Let's forget um, Andy Burnham for a minute as the, as, the, as the mayor. And you've got Bernstein. Bernstein is the chief exec, or was, he's gone now. He absolutely ran that city to dominate Liverpool and, he, and they dominated us. They, they stole all our office space. Um, they became twice the size of us in that time. They got 19,000 hotel beds, we've got nine. And, you know, we are politically driven. Because of what's just recently happened with Joe Anderson and, and the councillors, those councillors would often jump into the officer's garden and they shouldn't be there. Why they shouldn't be there? It's because they don't have the knowledge to be there. But they have the political power to be there, even though they've never had that information or knowledge to be there. And so Joe would like that because Joe, that would give Joe his strength and political power. And the officers, I think, today, I think many of them, who are, some of them are amazing, will be sitting there 
and thinking that it's a great thing that the government's coming in. And Tony Reeves, who's the chief exec, who runs the council, uh, I think has done an amazing job when and he's cleaned it out. When you see the government's coming in, London, to the people who don't understand what's going on right now, what, what does that mean? So it's a bit hazy at the moment as to what's happened, but um, I think for a couple of months now, the two main areas, which is regen, which is basically all the properties we have in the city, uh, and highways are now pretty much controlled by the government. And the reason why they're controlled by the government is because they're the ones that have been uh, under attack from fraud and corruption. Now, I don't know who's done what or how it's happened, and that's not me to answer, that's for the police to answer it, but pretty much Joe Council raised £260 million to do our roads, potholes, curbs. And if you look at it from a Scouse perspective, you would say, surely that's 20 million, 30 million. Surely that's not 260 million. Surely that money can be put to, to betterment of the city based on, you know, youth centres being opened and, and uh, food banks and all the stuff that we have going on, homelessness. Surely 260 million pounds can be better placed than, for instance, outside of the Shankly Hotel, all the kids have been redone. Outside Dixie Hotel, all the kids have been done. Outside Dale Street, all the kids have been redone. Did they really need doing? No. So why did they raise £260 million to do it? Well, it was there. But also, it amounts to huge contracts being given out. And what you have to remember is, there are friendships within those contracts. Now, I don't know who's given out those contracts, but I do know that, let's say, even... I don't even know what I should say, actually. But um, you've got things like, you've got Joe Anderson as the mayor, and you've got his son, David Anderson, who is now gaining contracts with the companies that gain the contracts from the council. Now, surely that shouldn't happen. If you're the mayor, you shouldn't have your son gaining contracts from the council or from the companies that gain the contracts from the council. Still, after... What's well... Not everything now has been, well, Joe's power's gone. Mm. He's no longer the mayor. You've now got government in power yep. of the highways, as you've also got government in power of regeneration. So there's a site in Liverpool, not too far away from here, which we as a city have paid £6 million to compulsory purchase the land. That land then gained huge amount of value through planning. So it's now worth double, maybe even triple what we paid on a compulsory purchase order. Only for us to give it away for naught. Now, you could say, is that fraudulent? Or stupidity? <laughs> Either way, no one's that stupid, are they? they shouldn't be in, in power. And they have been. And they, these are the reasons why this has been brought under scrutiny. These are the reasons why the government have come in. These are the reasons why we have people in our city who don't have a home, people in our city who aren't getting fed properly. We have communities that have been bereft of funding for many, many years. We have 30 wards, and out of those 30 wards, where's the funding? But we can pay £260 million on the city centre yeah. for roads. Where's the funding for Walton? Where's the funding for Anfield? Where's the funding for Croxton? Surely. We have thousand people who are homeless. Surely. The, the funding's actually going down for youth clubs. Well, I think I think funding for youth clubs diminished some years ago and, yeah. the, and there's a splatter of it about. But I think it'd be very easy to not give away land for naught, only to gain planning later on. So each each planner permission for every apartment in the city centre is worth between fifteen and twenty thousand pounds just for the paperwork. So if I was a developer and I wanted to buy uh, a plan of permission with 200 apartments, that's worth three million pounds. What we do as a council is, we get said developer, bring him in. He says, I want that piece of land. We say, oh, that's great. What are you going to use for? I want 200 apartments on it. Okay, we'll give you the 200 apartments. We give him the land for naught. Then he gets the plan of permission that we know he was going to get because we're in charge of the plan of permission. And then he walks away with a valuation of three million pounds and he's, he's quitting. Why don't we keep the land, 
say, that's great. You want 200 pounds? We'll get you the 200 pounds. That's no problem. It's now got a valuation of 3 million pounds. We're going to give it to you for 2.5 million. You've just earned 500,000 pounds because you had a great idea and thank you very much. We have earned 2.5 million as a council. Oh, we can now pay for our youth centres. There's plenty of sites where that happens, by the way, every year. Now, if the city centre and the outlying areas took all of their plan of missions and, and just done that one little thing to ensure that that money then gets spread to the 30 wards, you'd have your youth centre home. You'd have your food bank fully funded. But we don't. Why? Are we fraud, fraudulent, or are we inept? It's one of the two. You can argue all day long about it, but but I believe, having the knowledge that I have on property and the politics that's gone on in the city that I've watched for a long time now, I believe that we should not give anything away for naught, ever. Just enough to the outside. Here we go. Hello, it's getting juicy. Big John's yeah. got a question. <laughs> come on, John. Come on, John. Not to the outside, <laughs> is it? You don't give away to the outside if we're trying to keep generating the city. Unless I'm saying not. But um, oh, always bottles gone. Said Your bottles gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, if you come don't on, mind, John. we were, come on, John. We, we come were on, talking John. And before the um, before the podcast, and you told us, I don't know, like the press, you got to be. Someone got in touch with you or something? When when the um, Shankly closed down, I was sitting there one day and then I came at the door. It was three detectives. Mm. And, you know, it's not a nice sight. If you don't mind talking about it. No, no. I, listen, I, I have no secrets. Ask me whatever you like. Um, three detectives came to the door and they said, uh, we need to see you urgently and talk through an issue we have. So right away you think something wrong, you know. I'll take you home and get your wife. So I went and got Kate and brought her down. And they hit me with a, a Miranda notice and a Miranda notice is there was a threat on your life. Now, the threat on our life was deemed as very serious. Uh, so much so, they left a 24-hour security car outside of the Shankly Hotel for six weeks. Uh, I then had a developer phone me one day. Someone I know really well. And he asked me, did I think various people were corrupt in the city? And I said, I don't care. I don't care whether they are or they're not. I'm trying to keep my business and my sanity and my life together, my family together. Um, and it went on for about 45 minutes and asked me a few more questions and then, and then he went. The next day, I got a, I got a text in um, from a very prominent politician and he said I hope you know I'd never hurt you or your wife I'm always here for you um, and I said was that just out of the blue as well oh yeah I hadn't spoke to him for months didn't you say that it went away well let me let me just finish that bit and, and I said I, I you know I have no extra ground with anyone I just want to save me business I don't want anything I just want to save me business you crack on with what you're doing and I'll crack on with what I'm doing and um, two days later, the three detectives turned up again. I said, it's all gone. What was that like? Like, what was it? Did you must have been, were you anxious to fuck? Well, how, how does the detective know it's gone away? The man on the notice, you know what I mean? Um, I believe <laughs> it was on the encrypted phones that they were all listening to. It was at the same time. So... I don't care about threats. I never have. I don't care. I don't care if I die tomorrow. I just don't care. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. Bring my wife in, then I've got an issue. But that just made me come up with my plan. My plan was get my investors on side, get myself back open again, make sure that everyone knows I've not took a single penny, nothing. I don't live, everyone who knows me knows I live a very normal life. I don't have big holidays. My car's eight years old. You know, I don't have watches. I don't, I don't believe in, in all that rubbish at all. I just felt as though my time will come. Buy me time, wait, get open again. Keep on talking the way I am about the council, what they're up to, you know. And my view of the council is, it isn't just the top guy. It is 
the councillors that have supported that mechanism. And let's let's see what that mechanism is. Let's see what's proven and what not pro- what's not proven in the end. But certainly there's no smoke without fire. And and absolutely, you know, there are still people within that council, uh, still there today, uh, that have absolutely caused issue for this city in regard to not gaining the funding that they should have in regard to not gaining the funds for the sites yeah. that as we well have. as the big the big old people on the council too on I'll just, the, look i've got yeah. i've got there's a couple in the council yeah. that, are, that that i love you know that, that i think are like you know i won't say the names of them because um you know it wouldn't be fair on them because they probably get beaten up on the back of it but there's some of them are absolutely amazing but there's an awful lot that aren't there's an awful lot that are absolutely self-serving and should never be in that position. Yeah. And and I believe that there should be more people coming forward. And I, I know, you know, I'm a Labour guy, but, you know, you've got to start looking at what is right and what is wrong. You know, we're, we're putting people together now. And let, let's look at Keir Starmer. I, I quite like Keir Starmer, to be honest. And when he stopped the three ladies from getting their mayor position or, or certainly in, into, into a position to become mayor, I thought, wow. He's going to come up with something here. He's got someone like a Teddy Lee. He, Tesco took Tesco from a four billion valuation to a 32 billion valuation. Scouser, you know, I think he's from Bellevale, somewhere around there. Absolute god of a man, you know, like brilliant. I thought, wow, you know, we're going to get someone land here. We're going to take us, take us out of this abyss and lead us down that garden path. And then we end up, and it's not against, you know, the two candidates that are there now, but one's 26, you know. I'm 55. There's, he won't know like a fifth of what I know, you know. And I, and I look and I go, "Who have you ever employed? Who, who have, what have you ever created? What have you ever done? You know, you missed on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you want to stay off all week, you know, do you put in the hours? And I'm sure he does. But if this world is about creation of jobs and um, bringing an investment, and it is, absolutely is. You sort that out. That's the amber nectar to everything. How do they bring that to our city? And that's what I'm amazed about. Otherwise, would just go you, back to the Would you like to do it, Lawrence? <laughs> you know, if all things were equal and, and you could just become... Because you've got the experience, haven't you? Look what you've sure, done. Sure, sure. But, but I put myself forward for Labour. I didn't even get an email back. I put myself forward for Labour Party to be nominated for that position and I didn't even get an email back. Okay. So you could run as independent if you wanted, though, couldn't you? You can, but like, you know, as an independent, um, you need 52,000 votes. 52,000 votes at least, I would think, because that's what Joe got. Um, Lib Dems got 26,000 votes, I think, last time. You're going to get 50 odd thousand people to get off the backside and go and vote. Mm. And without that, and people vote blindly, People didn't, 52,000 people didn't vote for Joe Anderson. They voted for the badge. And am I known enough? See, that's the difference. It would be Lawrence Kenroy, wouldn't it? That'd be Lawrence Kenroy, wouldn't be Labour. Yeah. And I am Everyone I known just enough? votes Labour. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's that. Yeah. But there is maybe a tidal wave against the local politics now. And so it needs to be looked at. And, and whether you believe me or not, you know, I get in the morning, I only think about Liverpool. I don't think about anything else. I don't care about London. I don't care about England, Wales, Scotland. I've got nothing against them. But Liverpool is the place I've lived here for 55 years. I haven't moved. I've never lived anywhere else. I've only ever lived here. I only cared about here. Um, but I do think it'd be too difficult to beat Labour. I think Labour will always win. Who's going to have a clash? <sighs> um, do you know you need a big machine to beat Labour? And and I'm in the in the sort of the clutches now of of trying to rebuild and rekindle that business. And by the way, you know we 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 sold out on a lot of our events and we sold out a lot of, of all of our rooms. So I'm very confident about the business going forward. We've reinvented ourselves, and we you know we know for a fact that tourism is gone, and we and we know we have to turn to to our own people to make sure that they come and stay in our hotels, and they might live only two miles down the road. And I think we've created the right remedy for the situation. I think we're going to come out well. Yeah. But on saying that, I still in the back of my mind, I think, oh my God, what's going on to Liverpool now? Yeah. Joe, for all his issues, um, was entrepreneurial. In my view, just got caught up with the wrong people. But he was entrepreneurial. 
When does all that come to a head with all that? Sixth of May. Now, when you're saying the city's being the government now in control, what does that mean? And when, where does it go from there? So in, in all departments, the government will oversee, but not get involved. That's how I believe it at this point. Um, I think that more than overseeing regeneration and the more than overseeing highways, I think they're actually in the detail of that. And I've been for some time. Uh, I think we've got a great chief exec. Never met him, by the way. Supported him many times, but never met him. Um, he's shown a great strength of character by not succumbing to a bout of gangsterism. Uh, and I think um, I applaud him for that because it, Liverpool could be a scary place. Anyway. Anyway. Just Look them little that. awkward silences. Like, next time. I'm stumped sometimes. Like, I, don't I, know. Really know, I don't know much about politics. But, but you know what's right and wrong, don't you? Yeah. And, uh, and what, what you're saying, when you're saying it's a scary place, it seems like it in the way I let you all in. You know what I mean? We, we, a lot of people like myself, not knowing politics, we walk around you know, with our eyes closed, don't we? In that situation. You know I mean? we, so so let, me, let me just run through that. Okay. You have a governance in Liverpool which has control over at least 15,000 properties and God knows how many pieces of land. Each one of those armed with uh, planning could be worth millions. If you were of that world mm. and all you had to do is befriend certain people, that's an awful lot of money. And my argument is that money has to be spent on the triangle upside down. And what I mean by that is I'm at the top of the triangle. I own hotels. I can look after myself. I know the people at the bottom. Turn upside down. They're more important. How do we ensure that we looked after the bottom of that triangle? Society can only be valued on outlooks after it's most vulnerable. Yeah, so so me, Lons, I am Labour because I'm told I'm Labour and I'm from Labour and the people and the communities that I'm from, we need Labour. So what? how do you see that as like, if you was to run independently, how would you? So I'm, I'm not, I, 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 I'm Labour because I'm, you know, son of a docker, son of a coat worker, all that sort of stuff. And, and you know, that's the way it is. Um, but I'm not left of left or right of right. I am middle of the road. I do believe in entrepreneurial socialism. I do believe in people going out there, earning a pound and sharing it, which is what I do. Proof of that is any money I had spare, I owned a homeless shelter. Yeah. We had a whole uh, regime for neat kids, um, ensuring that the kids that didn't have an education, I haven't got an education. I left school at 15 at, in Easter. I haven't got a, an O-level, I've got a couple of O-levels when I went to night school, but really I've got no education. Yeah. What I have today, I have let myself along the way. So um, making sure that you give back, I think, is really important, irrespective of whether you're left or right. Yeah, yeah, right or wrong. Let's, let's not be worried about what side of the fence we're on. Let's just worry about our most vulnerable. And if we look after our most vulnerable, mm. everything else will look after itself. And then as a city to become more powerful as a city to get um, uh, more investment and create more jobs, we need to make sure that the best of those people that are in those positions are there. Whereas now it's about friendships. It's not about who is the best person for that role. Yeah. It's about you being by my side for 25 years and an out leaflet, so therefore you're going to get that job. Yeah. That's not good enough for Liverpool anymore. We are a top city. I, I I go to Guangzhou, Shenzhen. I've been to India. I've been everywhere you can think of: Vietnam, Korea, all the way. First thing people say: Liverpool. More than Manchester, yeah. our brand Liverpool is bigger than Manchester's, yeah. but yet we're half the size because we've been politically driven for years and not business driven. Manchester's business driven. We're politically driven. We need to change our course, and we need to change our leadership. The problem is. The first ones that go in into those shoes are going to get battered by the left of. You're going to be strong enough to battle back. I am strong enough to battle back. I don't care. Mm. 
But is it the right time for a business person to take over the reins as mayor? Probably not. But we'll Why? See well, you know, today um, the report actually got read out in the House of Parliament today and it was very damning on the city. I mean, extremely damning. I think we need to all understand what that means. Um, the mayor's going forward, uh, but I think... Um, because Joe's no longer there, and he, you know, he was—he's a powerful local politician. Joe, really powerful. At one point, he was voted in the top ten most powerful people in the UK. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like extremely powerful guy. Um, he wanted the mayor role. Uh, now he's gone. There's an awful lot of people that don't want the mayor role. But I believe in the mayor role if chosen correctly, if the right skill set was at the top of that pinnacle. And at this moment of time, I don't think it's a politician. That's just my view. Well, as you said, it's like Liverpool's main draw now is tourism, is it? And it's like, I don't know where Brexit affects this, but people can't come here. Yeah. They can't come. I know. So what's, what's going to happen? We're in trouble. That's what I mean. We're in trouble. So we need someone with an entrepreneurial so before, to create. So before... Brexit and before COVID, the unemployment around the UK was 3.9%. We were three points worse than that. We are, as you just said, tourism driven. So we are going to see you just use. Now everyone's saying, oh, staycations, we're going to be fine. Staycations goes to the lakes or Devon. No one's going to come to Liverpool for seven days. People no. want seven days. We're going to be an infill. I'm not saying we won't do it. Please God we do. I hope it's all going to be fine. But you're going to see an awful lot of unemployment in tourism. Fact. We need someone that can counter that, create that narrative, get that out there, push it out hard, like I do. What, to get people to stay longer, you mean? Well, no, no, no. We've got an amazing brand that's never been pushed. Why? Because Joe Anderson, whoever the leader's been before, don't understand the importance of that narrative. Or they might lay on to someone else to do I understand that narrative. I understand mm. how important that is. Getting out that narrative and pushing it out as strong as it needs to be in order to bring in that investment, in order to bring in that tourism, is absolutely paramount to us now. And we haven't got time to waste. And people might go, oh, you know, it'll be okay. It won't be okay. Because soon enough, you will have Johnny who can't get a job. Jane who can't get trained because there's no job at the end of it. So there's going to be an awful lot of issues coming that people don't see right now. It's like people talk about COVID. Oh, you know, it's going to be okay in the end. It won't be. There's going to be an awful lot of unemployment. Yeah, of course. Business so, is going on every single day. Re relying on not, tourism. Not yet, because, not yet because you've got furlough. Mm. So administrators, liquidated receivers are all sitting there waiting. Furlough has prolonged it. So the liquidations and receivers haven't happened because the businessmen are holding on by the fingertips. When furlough stops, then you'll see everything drop. Yeah. Restaurants. But it's also going to take a while to build businesses back up, though, isn't it? So, it's not like so you need money. You, so you need you need money in circulation in order to build those businesses back up. So, government's going to have to print money. When they print money, you're going to have inflation. So your pound won't be worth as much. So there's an awful lot of jostling going to go on before all this makes sense. Mm. And all I'm saying is, forget all the noise. Keep that one path. That path is create the narrative. Bring in the investment, get the jobs, keep our heads down, and crack on. The problem is, the next mayor, for a fact, I think, will be Labour. Do the two candidates that have been put forward by Labour, do they have the skill set to create that narrative? Do they understand what the narrative is? Do we have the time scale for them to understand, to learn it? Can they learn it? And if they don't, all that's going to happen is the city will be bereft of investment and jobs. One thing I've always always thought, well, there's no the man in power. Yeah. When you say the mayor, the president, the prime minister, is he in power? Do you know what I mean? Because or is he getting told what to say, what to do? Well, th th there is. You, you've just seen that with with America, haven't you? So, Trump, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you've seen that. So he he is the man in power. He's the most powerful man in the world. But was he? You know, That's so so behind the scenes, you know, like so in the UK, we have an awful lot of very powerful ministers. Don't forget those min ministers understand. Um, how to get from door to door and what those corridors are because they've been there for 30 years. 
you're a prime minister, you just come in, you're laying the rope right away. Who do you rely on? You rely on the ministers. The ministers can cajole you to whatever path they want. Yeah. So, so they are more powerful in some ways. So it's the narrative already set, no matter who you are in some cases. I, I don't think you can just walk in to a corridor and create your own doorways right away. I think that takes time. I think Margaret Thatcher done that because she was there for such a long time. I think Tony Blair done that because he was there for such a long time. I think it takes time to do that. You're not going to come in overnight. They won't allow you to come in overnight and just change. Yeah. Liverpool was different. Joe Anderson was powerful enough to create his own doorways. It's like St Steve Rotherham. He's a very good metro mayor. Um, not as powerful in some ways as Joe. Um, Steve Rotherham was in charge of transport and, and other things. And he's just he just ploughed £17 million into what's going to be a new film studio. So applause for that. That's really good. Um, but Joe, as a city mayor, in some ways, was just as powerful, even though um, Steve Rotherham actually controls over 2 million people. Not controls, probably the wrong way, but he is, he is the mayor for over 2 million people. He, he's, he's over the six areas, whereas Joe was just over Liverpool, but Liverpool is a dominant player. So in some ways, you know, I can see Steve Rotherham not wanting the Liverpool mayor. And, and the, you know, like uh, in Highland, there should only be one, you know, there should only be one mayor. We've now got um, a ceremonial mayor. It's three mayors, basically, isn't it? Uh, well, the ceremonial mayor doesn't really count. Yeah. And sorry, to, I'm not being disrespectful to, to anyone who, who has, has had that role. It's a great role to have. Um, but no, it's not got no power. Mm. It's, you know, it's just a ceremonial position. And you got the metro mayor. The metro mayor... Um, should actually um, have gained more power. But I don't think what Andy Burnham done lent himself to government for government to give more power. Mm. Because when he went against the government, I think they stopped with the view of, do we want to give these mayors more power? And I think th I think that stopped it. But we'll see. So look, Lawrence, so... We've, we've established that tourism is the main thing for Liverpool. So what, as you said, about when, once furlough goes, that's when people are going to feel it. So there's no tourists coming to Liverpool. Restaurants are going to close. Hotels are going to be on the demise. And there's loads of stuff that rely on tourism. So people are going to lose their jobs and then business is going to shut down. Do you think Liverpool is going to be like a bit of a ghost town in parts? And if so, what would what what is the answer for that? What is like, what do you think could be done? If we're not careful, we are going to become what Liverpool is to Southport. Manchester is to Liverpool. Oh, okay. So Southport has become a tourist destination. That's all it is. And no disrespect for Southport, by the way. I go there all the time. Liverpool is a tourist destination, but it is no longer the business driver. Manchester is the business driver. Mm. So we've got to be very, very careful and we need to fight back or they're going to take our legs away. They've already half took them away. Just to give you an example, office space in Liverpool, this is your this is your, your best way to to determine how well Manchester's doing business wise compared to Liverpool. Um, Manchester on their uh, their grey day office space is thirty six pound a foot when they rent it. How much? Thirty six pound a foot. When you peel back the onion on ours, it's about fourteen. So that means that there's not many people wanting yeah, office yeah, space, yeah. even though they're thirty six. Yeah, yeah. Still want to go there. So years ago, you'd have a, a big office in Manchester and a smaller satellite office in Liverpool. Now they're saying, nah, don't really need that. Let's just have the one in Manchester. Yeah. And everything just got sucked in by what is now the capital of the north. Who came up with that term, capital of the north? Manchester did. Mm. Why? Because they're better at PR than what we are. Yeah, yeah. Because they're business driven. And that just creates that hub then, doesn't it? Just and we're not. The place to be. Manchester is the place to be. I mean, I think Liverpool's better. I'm bound to say that. But if no one knows Liverpool's better, Liverpool is more compact. It has more listed buildings, i.e., you know, when when Magadachi didn't give us all that money that lead to Manchester got, they knocked down all their buildings. We kept all of ours. We, we turned ours into hotels and, and, and buildings that look stunning now. When yeah, yeah. they didn't look stunning. So I think when people come to Liverpool, they respect Liverpool more. Um, but Manchester is winning. There's no two ways about it. And, and I know it sounds like I'm, I want to go to war with Manchester. I don't want to go to war with Manchester. <laughs> I just want to battle with Manchester and try and win back some of that cake that they stole from us. So are you saying have it more of a business-driven place? Or we have a quarter that's business? We, we, if we want to survive, have to 
be more business driven. There is no doubt. So whether it's up to. in power now, is he doomed? Well, he or she, is he doomed? Let's see Anthony Lavelle it's wins. Sad, isn't it? Let's see Anthony Lavelle wins the, the mayor position. Good luck to him. He's 26 years of age. He's, I think he's been a councillor since he was 19. He's got, never employed anyone that I know of. He's never brought an investment that I know of. That is the gig. You have to bring in investment. You have to go out there and sell the city to the world. You have to create that narrative. You have to push out to the four corners. What an amazing city that is. Can he? Has he? Could he? I don't think we can afford to give them options. We have to have someone like Teddy Leahy or someone amazing who comes in and says, I've done this before. It's going to be, it's going to be massive pressure now on whoever gets that job, isn't it? And it's, but You're going to watch like a hawk as well. You're going to have to be. This isn't an ego-driven thing. It isn't about, I, I, I've got an ego, I want, I want to be the mayor. <sighs> this isn't about that. This is about, if you take that role, you should be under pressure. Because mm. you, you are actually running the gauntlet over this city for years to come as to whether our children gain those jobs or they have to leave the city because there's no jobs here. And that's a fact. Mm. And that's going back to the 80s and people started going and this could, this could happen again. Yeah, I, I, I don't think the 80s... Are, no, what I mean is when people had to leave yeah. because there was no jobs, that could happen again, well, do you think? Well, if if we don't start being more business driven, of course that's going to happen. There's mm -hmm. no jobs here. If we're three points behind the rest of the UK already, I mean, we might be now. Who knows what we are now? I can't even find the figures anymore. But if 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 we are behind the rest of the UK, people will leave. And we've got a great opportunity. We've got an amazing university. We should have, I went to Joe Anderson oh, two, three years ago. And I said, you know, let's future-proof the city. Uh, you've got Cunard, they've got 18,000 square foot in Cunard, not getting used. I said, let's put in a load of desks. I'll go there every week and I'll do a talk. You go every week, you do a talk. Let's bring every single businessman that we can do talks to all the people that are uh, socially online, who can code, who can create apps, and when they leave that university, they don't go, I'm going to Manchester or Glasgow or London. They're saying, actually, there's a fantastic place here where they can go and get a free desk and I can get connectivity to Joe Anderson. I can get connectivity to all the best men and I can get work off them. You know what's amazing here? What do they do? Go online. It's amazing. Liverpool. All of a sudden, that little thing, you're future-proofing your city to ensure mm. that there's... It all stays. Because it is a and massive education, well, education city, thing, isn't it? Isn't it? You, know, you, you know kids who can, who can code can earn over £100,000 a year mm. just coding on apps. You can't get them. Mm. They're all in London or Manchester. They're not here. Yeah. There's a few. And we need to make this into a hub. That was three years ago when I said that to Joe. He doesn't understand it. Mm. He doesn't understand the new world. If you don't understand it, you don't want to talk about it. If you don't want to talk about it, you're not going to do it, are you? We need people who understand the new world. We need to future-proof yeah, the, future, the city. Of course future, it is. Of course it is. You were talking before about it with me about how grown men talking yeah. about social media so from 10 years back it sounds stupid it sounds yeah. so daft it, it sounds pathetic do, do you know we, we talked a bit about the other week when, when we were on the podcast um, I spent every day in my life doing 10 blogs a day to control search term mm. and I'd done it in one of the hardest sectors in the UK at the time Liverpool went from 2,400 beds to 9,000 beds in an eight-year period, and we had to go through one of the worst economic environments the world's ever known. Mm, and we went to the top hotel here, all on the SEO that I done, search engine optimization, all on the content writing that I did. Why aren't we doing it for the city? Who control, oh, sorry, sorry. Who controls <laughs> the search term for nights out in the UK? Who controls the search term for best night out in the UK? Who controls all these search term? Yeah. No one. Mm. No city does. Why aren't we doing it? That's the sort of stuff I'm talking about. Do so you think you could do. market Liverpool big time? That's my game, innit? Do you put yeah. your success down to having that ability to control the system? If you want to find out anything, what do you do? Exactly, yeah. Okay. There you go. Let's go for me, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, future, Lawrence, 12th of April, everybody is... Hotels back? Uh, Hotels no, uh, outside areas. We've got Rainer Law open, Shankly open. We might have a couple more areas, might get open. And then in May, we're opening this hotel. Then in June, 
Yeah. There should be no restrictions, but we'll be the same. Cool. What's the plans for yourself and your businesses? Well, we, we've, Jordan, COVID, we've finished both Raynal Hall and the Dixie Dean Hotel. We've got another hotel in Preston that we're working on now, which should be finished in July. And then I've got a couple of hotels that we've got to go and try and get back because we lost a few hotels along the way. Now that we're trading, well, hopefully when we're trading, once we're trading, you can go and gain funding. No one's going to give anyone funding while you're closed because how do you pay back the debt? Mm. It's impossible. And there's no one in the funding sector of hotels at present. Pretty much everyone's left. Uh, all the money's going into residential now. Is that because they believe that there's no future? No, they, no, it's not that they don't believe there's any future. If you think about it from a funding perspective, why would you put money into a hotel at, let's go with Shankly. Shankly's got a valuation of 35 million. So um, why would you put 35 million or say 20 million, whatever it may be, into a Shankly hotel that you don't know when it's opening? And if you do, you don't know where the customers are coming from. Now I can say all day long, I've got I've got it sorted. I've, I'm, I'm doing the events on the roof, and I'm going, yeah. the hotel's going to be full. Too risky. Enough. They want to see it, so you're going to have to trade for six months, prove your model again, to show that you can pay back loans. So these are the sort of things that government should be involved with to allow businesses to pay back their loans, or to allow businesses the time in order to get new loans in in order to pay off old loans. Yeah. Um, and I think I think if we don't do that, I think you're going to see an awful lot of liquidations. Your advice loads for people like yourself coming through, um, how much, how big of a role does creativity play a part? I think I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit abnormal. I don't think I'm, I'm normal at all. I, I work all these hours and I'm a little bit creative and I like to be creative. Um, but I also like to understand detail as well. So I'm, I'm a bit... Strange, I think, when it comes, or so your wife tells me anyway. I, I think anyone coming into into business, they need to grab hold of a mentor, someone like me, someone who's fallen over. Mm. Someone who's just raised up and, and just, you know, like a Facebook, they won't understand the pitfalls. You need someone who's fallen over, and now I've fallen over. And this time, you know, I'm pretty much scraped my knee this time, and I'm pretty much fallen over because of COVID. But I think I've gleaned an awful lot of information and, and created the tenacity, what you need. Because the ones who hold on, that win in the end, not necessarily the cleverest. It's holding on. It's like you in a boxing match, isn't it? Yeah. He's just tagged you with one right across your chin. You think, am I going to go to my knee? I'm going to hold on. You hold on for dear life. That means wins many fights, doesn't it? Yeah. It's the one who holds on. Cracker on, right? Like the frog in the store. Before. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I wasn't here, so I don't You know. wasn't, no, I think. Lawrence, let me ask you, right? Yeah. Why do you do what you do? Like, where does that drive come from? What is it you want? It's the million dollar question. Is it the there. buzz? Is it just the buzz? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, what springs you out of bed? It's like, why doesn't things get boring? Because you've opened hotels, and you'd open another one. Like, what is it? When will you ever be happy? I think... Um, I don't mean happy, but well, you'd always want to keep moving forward. So I, I, I'm a born entrepreneur, and you might go, that's good. It's not a case. Mm. A born entrepreneur is never happy. I'm never happy. I'm always pushing on to the next thing. So, you know, I'm a kid from Walton. I opened my first hotel. That should be good enough, shouldn't it? And then, you know, before now, I've got 17 building sites. And then I go through Brexit, and then I go through a pandemic, and I hold on, and I keep hold of it. And then I re-pivot to a different tune, and I start doing hotel in, in a different way in order to survive. But then I realize, actually, this is really works. Mm. You know, so then I go down that path. And then, you know, now at this moment of time, we've got a couple of really large funds that want to fund us going forward, which is great. But they don't truly understand the model either. So now you've got to be a, a guy who can pitch and, and, and get them on board because you're not talking about a couple of million pounds, you're talking about hundreds of. So... Now you find a different path altogether. I think you're still not happy. <laughs> and, and I think what we found with Signature Living is we are uh, we do events that have a bed and we sell experiences with other people to sell, you know, a vanilla hotel room and you're not getting experience at all. And I think we've realised that that experience is what people want now, especially now after COVID, especially after people have been locked up for so long. And then you want to really expand that take it to more cities and that's where I'm at now and I don't think I'll be happy until 
we have it in many more cities. And I think we went into COVID with five hotels. I think we come out with about nine. And I'm still not happy. <laughs> on the last podcast, I think it was about, you said you were about 30 or something long, you decided to retire and you couldn't. Yeah. If this is your situation when it comes to it's a repeating pattern in your business, what makes, what where do you find contentment in life? I, 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 I said before that it's a curse. I don't think I'll ever be happy. I don't think uh, I'll I, ever stop. I think it's like an artist thing. I think it's a, being creative. Like, cause we, you took us around the hotel, which you mentioned before, yeah. and you literally was like Willy Wonky. You were excited. You were like, you were going, get on this bit, don't get on this. <laughs> and like that, like, you can see the excitement in your face. I, I, Is I, that I, where you get your buzz? I, I want to shock you as soon as you walk through the door. But you got a buzz out of our response. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I've got to keep, that's the problem though. Like tomorrow when you go around another hotel, you'll be expecting that. So I've got to slightly pivot to a different tune on that one. Yeah, and, yeah. and I've got to make sure that every room you go in, you go, hold on, what's that? <laughs> you know, and if I get a watch that, then I know that, you know, you've got not come into something normal. Yeah. And it's going to be totally unique and different in order but, for to be a boastful play. Because I know, it's, I know it's obviously different and it's on different scales, but these videos I make, I ask myself, why do I do them? Why? Well, you make people laugh, don't you? I love, I love to get a positive response. I, yeah, I like to get a positive response from people out of something I've created. Yeah. And I'm spreading joy. Cool. And that makes me feel good. Mm. But it's similar, but on a well bigger scale. That's well, what I've seen when you took us around the hotel and the way your face goes, it lights up. Like you're getting up in the middle of the night and putting roses up on it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, crazy. That's where you get your buzz, I think. And, and, and I'll wake up at three and I'll run downstairs. And, and people will say, but you're mad, aren't you? Because you work all these hours. And I say, well, if you're an artist, and you had a canvas downstairs in your basement and you went down at three o'clock to the, the canvas in your basement, you're just enjoying yourself, aren't you? That's what I'm doing. Mm. But it is a case. I'm never happy. I think you're an artist and business is your medium. Maybe. Could that's be your, politics. That's your easy. Hey, could be politics. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep that one for round three. <laughs> Lawrence, um, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, yeah, enjoy getting to know you as well. Thank you. And you've inspired me, and yeah, I'm grateful I've met you, the cracking fella. Thank you. Nice I'm one, on the dig dunk. <laughs> <laughs> Next time on How Are We Family Land podcast, we'll be speaking to Andy Grant. Like 60 fellas at week one, day one, and 60 fellas are standing in a, in a shower cubicle, and the corporal, he, he does a little trick though as well to make it funny. And there's like 60 lads standing there in flip flops and towel, and then there's, you know, one fella in his 30s standing there naked under a shower saying right lads this is how you wash your armpits you know get it wet first <laughs> get the shower gel wash it there and then he gets his knob and he uh, he pulls his knob back but what he'd done before and to make it funny is he put loads of dirty lee oh smeg me he goes like he builds it up he goes right lads if you haven't um, if you haven't washed it for a couple of days what can happen is as you pull your foreskin back and all this cheese starts to come out oh hey and, uh, and then he put on he, he put on the towel and his ass crack as well. So when he started washing his ass, like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's it, it's not it's serious in the sense of <laughs> sounds it. It's a serious point in the sense that um, you know they're showing you, but it's fucking hilarious as well. But, but you know what? On, on on a serious point though, I know we're laughing about it now. I'd be surprised how many people are like yeah. You imagine, um, and this is a serious point for a minute. You imagine growing up maybe. Um, with just just your mom, maybe not a not a male role model around, and no one's actually taught you the birds and the bees yeah, and, and yeah, how, yeah. how to shave and how to do this. So, yeah. was, you know, we're sitting here now going, "Fucking hell!" Imagine someone telling you how to shave or to brush your teeth. But imagine if you've not had someone to do that. Faster Car Finance provides a smooth, hassle-free way for you to apply for car finance and to get the vehicle of your choice. Whether you have good or bad credit, no deposit is required. A decision is reached within minutes and one of our dedicated finance advisors will be available to discuss your requirements. Apply now at www.fastercarfinance.co.uk.